If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. Link and Zidon, being best friends like best friends do. When last we left off, the duo had solved the riddle of that massive tablet the historian had discovered, and they were beginning their ascent up another series of broken up sky islands. Gravity up here is pretty weak, and that's super awesome. There's more motion to their movement, more joy in casual jumping, less punishment for missing a landing. But at this point, Link has been through so many climbs in a sense that he just decides, nah, and flies his way up to the top of the broken sky island. And what lies at the top is a rather lovely place, the Water Temple, once the great wellspring of Hyrule. It is now, however, the source of sludge raining down upon Zoro's domain. What is creating the sludge is very apparent, and it's a stain upon the beauty of this place. But it's also such a powerful force that they can't really just spray it down. Something mighty is at play here, and they need to match it with equal force. Sidon sees massive faucets over the sludge source, but only one of the five is active. They try pouring water from one of the sources over the sludge, but it's not enough to fully cleanse it. They need all five faucets active to do so. And that voice that they heard a while ago returns, confirming to them that if they can turn on all five water sources, then it will be enough to bring out the pollutant of the Zora's domain. Well, never fear. At this point, Link is an absolute pro at this. Find each of the levers and turn on the water, this time with his good buddy Sidon at his side. The hostility in the temple comes in the form of ancient Zonai tech, things that Link has tangled with several times over. The focus of this place seems to be solving basic puzzles in low gravity, and it's a lot of fun, really. Link and Sidon go from lever to lever, getting each of the faucets turned on using creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. When the duo is done, they turn the power of those faucets onto the sludge pumping out of the center of the temple. The cascade is like a torrent of water, or like getting hit by a fireman's hose, not something that I would want to be in front of. What pops out is a nugget of sludge that moves all on its own. <laughs> it's small enough that they don't really notice it at first, but when it finally pops out of its ick, it's... Oh, it's just so menacing. Like, don't worry guys, it's not real, it can't hurt you. This is the Mukta Rock, and though it's small, we have to give this thing some credit. It has ruined a lot of people's lives for a while. And from the sludge, it can create its own wicked defenses, so I stand corrected. It's a pretty menacing beastie. Link pretty much has an arsenal that can clean sludge at this point. When applied here, it will temporarily banish the Mukta Rock's summoned Ick companion and open it itself up to attack. But it takes patience and good aim to actually land watery attacks because this is a highly mobile beast. And when it is exposed, it tries to run away through muck puddles that slow the night down. So plan accordingly. Frustration can settle in quickly with this guy. At the halfway point, the Mukta Rock starts spewing sludge around the arena and it starts diving all over the place and shooting turd beams that deal a fair bit of damage. The Mukta Rock is a surprisingly adept foe, but in the end, the Knight and the Prince kill the Scourge of the Water Temple and end the reign of sludge that has been terrorizing the Zora. As the beast fades away, so too does the Muk. The day is saved, and tomorrow will be brighter yet. Upon the altar that was once covered in sludge is another secret stone, not meant for the Knight, no. This one is meant for his good friend, Prince Sidon. Who else could possibly rise to be the next sage but him? When he touches the stone, they're taken once again to that now familiar place between realms, where an ancestor of the prince has been waiting. Like the sages before, she too expresses pride in Sidon's abilities and grace. The unnamed hero tells Sidon of the past, of the imprisoning war, of their failure to stop Ganondorf so long ago. The best they could do was a stalemate. After Raru's great sacrifice, Zelda came to each of the sages to beg their help. When Link's time in the far-off future came, they would all be needed to stand against the Demon King once again. This ancient sage vowed to lend their aid to that far-off time. To do so would be an honor. Now that that time has come, they will pass on their secret stone to Prince Sidon. It has been kept hidden away from the world all this time, but now dawns a new time for the Zora. Their soon-to-be king will also be their Sage of Water. Prince Sidon's mastery of the flow of water will greatly heighten with this secret stone. He was already formidable, now he'll be nigh unstoppable. Though he cannot accompany Link in what remains of his journey, he sends with the knight his avatar, which will offer him a shield and an attack of water. But when the time comes and Link faces down the Demon King of old, Prince Sidon will be at his side to battle against that great evil. With the sludge now gone from the domain, 
all that were done harm are set free from the pain that it caused, even the king himself. The waters flow clear once again, and things can start getting back to normal. Soon, Sidon will wed Lady Yona, but before that happens, Dorvin passes the crown down to his son. Now, King Sidon will sit on the throne and lead the Zora people on as their ruler and their sage. With Queen Yona at his side, the Zora have a prosperous future to look forward to. Sidon and Link speak once more before the night departs, specifically about Zelda. Her actions betray that she is an imposter. The real Zelda would never attack his father. The true princess was assuredly placed into the past, as was evident in the vision the old sage revealed to him. He will continue to look into the matter while Link is off journeying about. For now, they part ways until fate deems it time for them to be brought together once again. It's time to go see Pyrrha, to see this story concluded. Representatives from each of the four regions are here to keep their leaders abreast on things going on near the castle. They're all welcome sights to the night and a comfort. Each one stands as proof that Link is not alone in this. Pyrrha is thrilled at all his successes and the two speak briefly to make sure that she is aware of everything that has been going on around the kingdom. But as they're conversing, the moon appears in the sky and turns a vicious red. Pura's hawk-like eye spots something at the castle and she directs her telescope towards it for Link. It's that strange imposter Zelda standing before the entrance of the throne room. But Pura can't ignore the possibility that this could actually be Zelda. They need to act on it as though it is. She hurries Link on towards the castle to where they saw the princess. He's as ready as he'll ever be and they need to act on this fast. So the knight rushes back to the place that he once called home. Floating Zonai vehicles are his way up to the castle. He lands at the second gatehouse and spots the princess, just waiting for him, almost entirely unmoving. When he does get close, she briefly churns and then vanishes. In her place comes a swarm of Ganondorf's minions. This is meant to be a trap, and it's certainly not the only one. He finds her again in the library, another ambush. Yet still, Link tries to find her again. He pushes on into the castle. In a hallway she's waiting, then her old bedroom, then in the bowels of the castle he tries to make contact with her only to fail. Higher up again she taunts him into the castle where he's attacked by dangerous beasts, and then finally she bids him to enter the sanctum of the castle, the throne room. This time though, when he arrives, she finally speaks. She has been waiting and wants to show him something. This imposter casts a spell over the throne room and remakes it into the image of its glory days before the calamity destroyed it, back when things were difficult yet so much simpler, back when this place was home. It's a good trap setting, but, well, gosh, Ganondorf, he just can't be patient, can he? He plays his hand out like a novice rather than spring an attack. He speaks to the knight, though the way he speaks is very interesting. Interesting that for a being as powerful as he is, he's apparently very unaware of what has been happening in his absence. Unaware that Link survived their underground encounter, that he has been awakening new sages one by one, that Ganondorf's roadblocks have been all torn down. It's groan-worthy that Ganondorf really thought his puppet was fooling them this whole time, but also, did he not know what it was doing? Was it just happenstance that it caused all this trouble for the new sages, but then therefore it, it inadvertently made everyone aware of the temples and thus leading to them finding the secret sounds? You know what, let's just, let's just not overthink this. The absent Demon King sends in his place a phantom to combat Link. He's faced a few of these before. They're quite dangerous beings that really are not to be taken lightly. A few hits can destroy a health pool, so imagine his surprise when five of them appear. Link does have the aid of the avatars, but he must act with great care in this room. If he gets cornered or swarmed, then it means big trouble. Thankfully, the avatars do a spectacular job of holding aggro on each of the phantoms so that that doesn't happen. But at the halfway point, they change, they cheat. They respawn themselves and bring pools of gloom with them. Now Link risks harming himself just to get near them. He pelts them with arrows from afar and awaits opportune moments to charge in and attack them. As each of the phantoms are defeated, the fight gets easier and easier. There's less gloom on the floor to contend with even if most of Link's health pool has been destroyed. The knight and the avatars are able to defeat this onslaught of phantoms, sending a very clear message to Ganondorf that there's more to Link than what he originally thought. But like an absolute bitch, he sends another wave of gloom, his strongest opposition to the knight yet. It is intercepted by the sages themselves, who have finally arrived to lend Link aid against the Demon King. They do not recognize this being, after all, why should they? Knowledge of the founding of the kingdom and what happened to he and Raru was struck from history. 
Since they do not know him, he graciously introduces himself and then gifts to them an understanding of what the world once was, back when he crusaded across the lands, the world as he intends to remake it, just so perfect in his mind, where all that remains are mindless minions who kneel to him. The sages of this era all know well Ganondorf's face and his intentions now. This is troubling. It's terrifying. It must be stopped. But it is Riju who sees through what just happened. Ganondorf isn't strong enough to stop them, otherwise he would have just done it right here. He's buying time. They all calm themselves and return to Lookout Landing to plan their next move. Hearing what they all have to say makes Pura fully accept that the princess they've been spotting is truly an imposter. They all share their discoveries, making sure that everyone is on the same page. The true Zelda was lost in the past, her fate left unknown. That's troubling to them. And while they know that the Demon King is strong, they don't really know what he's capable of. Pura can't help but feel like they're missing something. If all their visions are to be believed, then there's another sage that is yet unaccounted for. Someone that they do not know the name of. They've only seen them in passing. If each of the ancient sages hailed from within a temple lost to time, then it stands to reason that this fifth sage is also within a temple. The four new sages will return to their homelands to search out prominent ruins there, in the off chance that they come across another temple. So with each of the territories taken care of, Link needs to search around Central Hyrule into the southeast. That's a lot of territory to cover. But with so many people to meet, tasks to see to, places to explore, it's sometimes easy to lose the plot. He visits Hatano and sees to a mayoral election, collects some amazing fashion, he saves and rebuilds Lurlin, he somehow finds himself in Terrytown visiting a couple that came together during the Calamity, and he eventually lands himself in Kakariko Village. There is some weirdness going on here. Huge ruins fell from the sky. Searching around, he learns that Impa is no longer here. She passed on the mantle of leader of Kakariko to her granddaughter Pea, and now she's out in Hyrule doing some investigating of something special, very interesting. Link will absolutely need to track her down to learn more. But for now, he goes to see Pea, who's with Taro, discussing what they call floating ring ruins. Seems that the imposter Zelda was here some time ago and had told them to stay away from the ruins. Now, Link might not have noticed anything special about these particular ruins, but that the imposter came here and told them to stay away is kind of a red flag. It immediately draws his interests to these ruins. Link sets them straight on who exactly the supposed princess really was. They completely trust Link in the matter, and since the imposter told them to stay away from the ruins, well, now they're going straight towards them. The ruins are opened up to researchers right away, and that includes Link. He starts poking around, looking for anything interesting that he can take back to Pura. He checks out deciphered slabs, jumps into a hollowed ring and takes a picture of a slab inside, he speaks to every prominent mind on location, and eventually learns the name Mineru, who was a sage in ancient times. Awesome, they found the name. Researchers Calip and Taro will be his experts on this matter and his guides moving forward. The images of that slab that Link took speaks of dragon lands in the southeast region of Hyrule, very close to where they are now. Calip remembers that in the nearby Farron region are Zonai ruins. It would be worth it for them to start their investigation there. Taro and Calip will join Link out in the field for research and help him find this dragon land and the sage Minoru. Their first area of investigation will be the aptly named Dracozu Lake. It seems to be an area rich in history and clues to the past. When Link tracks him down, Taro is giddy with the discoveries that he has made. He translated out some clues. Where are the electric garb hidden at the long-necked dragons along the wide-mouthed forest serpent? Offer a Zonai charge at the altar at the tail. Taro believes that this garb will be in the caves under tall pillars that look like dragons. So, off with Link. The first piece of garb is right in front of them, in a conveniently placed chest. The other two are down the river in different little caves much like this one. It all comes together to form some grade A fashion. With this outfit, Link's attacks will be heightened during lightning storms. With his fancy new attire on, he finds the tail of this series of dragon pillars and an altar. Upon it, he places a Zonai charge, and then he watches the lightning show begin. The sky lights up, the clouds get rowdy, and lightning hits the dragon pillars up the river. Then the clouds dissipate away, the sun comes out to lighten up the region, and a brand new series of sky islands appear from the chaos. Link and the researchers meet up again to discuss what just happened. Tara will write a report to Pura for this, Calip will continue field studies, and Link? Well, what do you think he's gonna do? That's right, skydiving! Then, get up to those islands. 
The weather is pretty nasty, but so long as he doesn't have anything metal equipped, it should be fine. Don't worry about it. When viewed from the top or from the map, these islands form the shape of a dragon, and Link needs to reach the head of it. It's a bit of a hassle, bit of a trek, bit tricky given the wet surfaces and wicked lightning going off. When he does make it down, it's head first. I'm just kidding, he's fine. On the dragon's head, the weather is much more enjoyable. It's a little oasis in the sky. And there's another door like the one that he encountered, what feels like ages ago, at the Sky Island Temple of Time. Once again, he needs to have enough vitality to break through it, but Link is no chump. He has plenty of vitality to break this door wide open. Inside on an altar is a really heavy looking mask sort of thing that's guarded by his own eye shield. It responds to his Raru arm and the shield lowers, which then opens up the floor, revealing a secret passage. The mask churns and locks onto something far off in the mountains below, and then a voice rings out with an order. Take the mask and follow the light. He takes a heavy relic, attaches it to a Zonai air vehicle down on the ramp, and flies down to where the beam is pointing. It takes him down into the mountains to a tucked away area that he really wouldn't have chanced upon by himself. The mask acts as a key of sorts on a pedestal that opens up a path down onto a platform, which activates and carries him away into the dark depths below. During the dark descent, the voice speaks to him again, acknowledging him as Zelda's chosen protector and then another command to hurry because they need to meet as soon as possible. When the platform finally comes to rest, the mask locks on again to a strange empty mold. There's already an abdomen piece in it, and the mask fits into the headpiece, and there are four other parts that he apparently needs to track down to complete it. The voice introduces itself as Mineru, the ancient sage of spirit. She directs him towards the four surrounding depots and asks him to bring together the parts of the construct being kept at each one. Simple enough task. Each foundry has its own set of puzzles and obstacles, but it's really a matter of patience to persevere. The enemies that patrol around the main factories are more intensive than the actual depots. Once the construct is ready, it springs to life. Minoru was one hell of a creator in her age, but her inventions still hold up as marvels. Their task doesn't end here though, because there's a secret stone that they need to collect and it's not too far away. They have to make the trek on foot, but as they go, Link learns about this being's abilities. It can be outfitted with weapons and crowd control tools and all sorts of Zonai tech. It doesn't need Link to act as a pilot to be effective in battle either, but should he need to be off the ground or in control for any reason, he can just hop on and act as the driver. Together, they slowly make it through the dark depths towards the ruins of the ancient spirit temple. It's definitely a shadow of its former self. Not a lot is left of this temple, really it's just some stairs and an elevator. But the inner sanctum, the interior of the temple, is covered in gloom. It's an indicator that trouble is ahead. A construct of Minero's own making has been waiting for them, but it's under the control of another now. As soon as it's within the gloom, it seals them in and it attacks the duo. Dealing damage to it directly just doesn't work out with Minero's new body. It's far too hardy. There is some vicious barbed wire around the arena that they can use, though. Link pilots the construct, and using stun, freezes, a hand cannon, and whatever melee weapons they can find, they're able to stop the seized construct long enough for Link to punt it straight into the barbed wire, which deals massive damage. Once they get the hang of its rotation and how to counter it, this thing is a chomp. It's a pushover, but a very fun fight. Link delivers a big KO to the infected construct, opening the path for them to retrieve Mineru's secret stone. When Link draws close, Minoru jumps out of the Pura pad. She's been close by this whole time, be that creepy or comforting, I leave up to you. The secret stone attaches itself to the construct, which will now be under her control. A new body, of sorts. Link is still welcome to guest pilot, but she will be the primary controller now. Once it's firmly attached, they go to that realm between places and Link meets the elder sister of King Raru. She has been waiting all this time to lend Link aid. She's very to the point with her gratitude and her intention. Now that she is restored to her full strength, she will aid Link as the Sage of Spirit in what is to come. Back in the real world, Minoru tells Link a bit about that era, how Zelda just sort of appeared one day and awakened as the Sage of Time. The princess had become a central player in everything that happened, and in the end, she made a monumental choice regarding the Master Sword. But then she slows down. She tells Link a bit more about her people's story, how the Zonai were descendants of and seen as gods in that far lost time. 
Their secret stones were gifts from the gods. Minoru's younger brother became a great leader, and he wed a Hylian priestess named Sonia. Together they founded Hyrule, and this fledgling kingdom entered an era of prosperity. Until an evil king from the desert emerged. Ganondorf murdered the queen, stole her secret stone, and became the terrible demon king. For a time, he crusaded and he conquered across the land. All within Hyrule rose up to fight him, but it was not enough to stop the Demon King. In their darkest hour, King Raru selected warriors from around Hyrule to ascend as sages with their own secret stones. But as Link well knows, they did not succeed. King Raru made the ultimate sacrifice, stalemating the Demon King to hold him dormant beneath the castle. This final confrontation is how Ganondorf came to know Link's name, and that his destiny would be awaiting him in the countless ages yonder. It was a meeting that Ganondorf looked forward to. When all was done, Minoru's body was dying. Zelda came to her before the end with the broken Master Sword and told her of her own intentions. And though initially she dissented, Minoru came to see that Zelda was correct in her planning. Though, what that plan was is still unclear to Link. Minoru does not overstep her place. She does not lay everything out before Link. It wouldn't be appropriate. He needs to see her sacrifice to understand it. Minoru directs Link towards the Great Deku Tree. Zelda intended for the knight to meet with the tree when he was ready to reclaim the sword. But he's not yet ready for that. There's too much missing. His thoughts go to Impa, who some years prior guided him in reclaiming his memories from over a century ago when the calamity happened. In Kakariko, he learned that she had gone out into the world, and at a stable near central Hyrule, Link ran across the Sheikah researcher Kato, who gave him directions towards Impa. She is out in a field, overlooking some drawings etched over the plain. And Link has spotted these around the kingdom, quite a few, in fact. Impa informs him that they appeared during the upheaval, and she's been trying to get a good look at them. Hard to do from the ground, though. So Link puts together a little hot air balloon for her, and sweetly takes her high up into the sky so that she can get a good look at the whole thing. While they're up high, she tells him a story about dragon tears. Within them are captured images or memories from their time of creation. If they can find one, then perhaps they can discover what the image holds. It might help them find the princess or learn what became of her. Impa is not shy about recruiting Link for this task. She sends him off into the field to track down the tear, and he finds it after a fair bit of searching. It's like a puddle in the ground that for most would be really easy to miss, but it reacts to the sigil that Zelda placed upon his hand back when he first woke up on that great sky island. The puddle reforms into a tear that shows Link the memory that it holds. It's Zelda, right after Ganondorf awoke, and immediately following her plunge into the dark depths. Link had seen her enveloped in a golden light, and this is what happened immediately after. She awoke in a field far in the past and was found by Raru and Sonya. The two parties immediately came to an understanding on who the other was, and Zelda was welcomed to the castle. For the next few days, Link takes time for himself and for Impa. He goes all across Hyrule, tracking down these geoglyphs, finding the dragon tears, learning more about Zelda's life in the past and the role that she played during the emergence of the Demon King. He sees her bonding with Raru, Sonya, and Minoru, knows how much she wanted to find her way home, saw the terror when Sonya was murdered by Ganondorf in front of her, felt the sadness that Raru harbored in the times after. And then the awakening of the sages, that final confrontation, and the end of Zelda's time there. In the final tears, Link sees the Master Sword delivered to the princess in the past. A responsibility falls upon her to see it restored for him. And to do this, she commits herself to a most frightening fate. She consumes her secret stone, loses her mind and her heart, and ascends to become an immortal dragon, with the sword embedded in its skull. The blade will bathe in her power for countless millennia to come, become stronger with every passing moment, so that in the future, so that now, it will be ready for him. The light dragon that Link has seen so many times in the sky, it was Zelda, and with her, the Master Sword. Now, he is ready to go see the Great Deku Tree. Of course, nothing is ever that easy. Something very odd is happening at the Lost Woods, the home of the Great Deku Tree. It's covered in a swirling vortex of dark fog. There are a few beings at the entrance, a traveler and a Korok, that are trying to get through it, but whenever they go in, well, they just find themselves back at the entrance. Just a short walk to the south, a massive hole has opened up, leading down into the depths. Link will head down there to see if maybe he can find a way up into the forest somehow. 
God, I hate how dark this place is. It's like plunging into an abyss. Thankfully, he can light the ground a bit before he crashes into it, and then he starts his trek to get underneath the Lost Woods, keeping his eyes upwards to see if he can spot a way to get back up to the surface. From a distance, he does see a pillar of some sort that looks like he can ascend through it. Actually, it looks like precisely what he needs. The walk there is pretty damn hazardous. It's creepy, it's dark, and some creations of Ganondorf are ready to stop his intrudence upon the woods. But eventually, he makes it up to that altar and finds that he can ascend through it, straight up into the Lost Woods, more precisely the Korok Forest at the heart of the woods. But the Korok and the Great Deku Tree are all unmoving, unresponsive, like they're frozen in time. Gloom is flowing from the inside of the Great Tree, where Link finds a hole leading down into the guts of it. There are Gloom hands down here, just jiggling about in the Great Deku Tree's innards, I imagine. And of course, just as Link experienced down in the depths once the hands are dispatched, then a phantom appears to fight the knight. Once these monstrosities are dispatched, Gloom vanishes from the inside of the Great Deku Tree and the Lost Woods are returned to normal. When they speak, the Great Deku Tree fondly recalls the last time that he had seen them, back when Link and Zelda returned to the forest to reclaim the Master Sword. After the Calamity was defeated, it needed some time to restore itself in the Sacred Grove. The world has faced an immense hardship since that time. Zelda and the Blade have both been lost, but the tree can help Link track them down. He can sense the Master Sword, even now. He directs Link towards where the blade rests. Actually, reaching it will be his responsibility. But Link has unlocked every sky tower on the map, so literally the sky is the limit now. He knows that wherever the sword is, the light dragon will be. He glides through the sky and lands upon the mythical beast. And sure enough, in the skull of it, there rests the master sword. Pulling on the blade causes the dragon discomfort. It bucks and throws its head about when he begins to force it out. It takes every bit of stamina he has to keep his grip on long enough to fully withdraw the blade. But when it's finally within his grasp again, it shines with a luster that it never had before. It's the most powerful this blade has ever been, all thanks to the actions of the princess so long ago. He is gifted with one more memory. The final words of the princess to him. Though the Demon King defeated her, the Master Sword, it will not happen again. Through Zelda's powers, the blade has been mended and stands ready to face Ganondorf once again. Her last prayer was for the sword to reach him in the far-off future. And finally, it's come true. Link now stands ready to track down and face off against Ganondorf. The knee-jerk assumption is that he would be under the castle, right where Link and Zelda left him, but... I mean, he wouldn't be that lazy, right? He would definitely move to a more strategic location. Right? Ganondorf wouldn't hang out under there where his weird crypt was, right? That would just be... That that would just be... Well, Puro recommends that Link search around the depths for Ganondorf. And the foremost expert on the depths is Jasha, so he goes to speak with the young lady on the matter. Jasha doesn't have a lot to give him, outside of encouraging him to follow the statues around the depths. And, well, okay, that's not a huge help. But Link goes down the high roll field chasm and starts heading south, looking high and low for anything that could indicate Ganondorf is here. Well, he doesn't find it, but he does find an interesting new ability that he'd missed up until now. Don't judge me. Auto build. Link can now memorize blueprints and store build orders in a list. And so long as he has the materials that he needs for them, he can just automatically make them now. And at this point, he has tons of resources saved, so he can build, save, and auto-build to his heart's content. He gives a demonstration to a few researchers on site, who then reveal themselves to be Yiga, who call out for their master, and well, 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 look who it is, it's Master Koga! See, and we thought that he had died back during the Calamity some years ago. If memory serves, he got dropped down into a massive hole in the ground. Something that no normal person could survive, but Master Koga is no normal man. And apparently, that massive drop down that hole is how the Yiga learned about the Depth's existence. Oh, what high drama and payoff. Master Koga has been trying to recreate the ability that Link just usurped, auto-build. He hasn't been able to learn how to do it, and he's outraged that Link just waltzed right in and took it from him took it from their lord, the Magnificent One, of course meaning Ganondorf. Their allegiance to the Evil King is no secret, it's kind of their whole deal. So now, they fight. 
to his credit, Koga just sort of makes things appear. Like, he can't auto-build on command, but he certainly can do something similar. And I'm starting to wonder if Koga isn't actually one of the most powerful beings in all of Hyrule, and we just sort of underestimated him. The two have themselves a bit of an arena fight that's a pure practice in gleeful mayhem. Ah, if only every foe could be as charismatic as Koga, but nothing lasts forever. Link overcomes the Yiga Master and sends his ass packing, but not before he spills the beans on where he'll be next, at the southwestern abandoned mine. Well, I mean, Link just can't let his best bud go like that, of course he needs to track him down and wrap up this little soap opera. So to the southwest mine he goes. While this is fun and joyous, Link is also banking on Koga knowing something about Ganondorf, specifically where he is right now. The fight in the southwest is a flying vehicle battle, after which Koga mentions restoring Ganondorf fully and using a final weapon to bring about the end of the world, and that's really an escalation. Then, they meet once again in the eastern abandoned mine for a water battle, after which Koga mentions that they found Ganondorf himself. Now things are getting extra juicy, but he won't tell Link where he is. He's going to go to the northwestern abandoned mine to see out their final plans. Getting there is no big deal. Travel is quick for Link at this point. At the final mining outpost, Koga proudly reveals their ultimate weapon, a Zodai construct. Link has already fought something like this before at the Spirit Temple, so this will be no big deal. But Master Koga reveals before their final fight that Ganondorf was found beneath the castle. Holy shit, he really didn't move after the upheaval, that lazy mother Well, time for some punch-out rumble. Each man is aboard his own construct, dealing out punches and putting up blocks. It's a shame to see their time coming to an end. It truly was a joyous affair. But Link defeats Master Koga one more time. And though the Yiga leader tries to get in one more attack, he ultimately fails and proves his own undoing. But we will not be so foolish as to assume that this is the end of the Yiga. Oh no. Master Koga is far too powerful to meet his end in such a way. He will live on. He will return. Just maybe it'll take a while, like a few decades or so. Link is armed with abilities, weaponry, armor of choice, and now knowledge of precisely where Ganondorf is. It's time to end this. The approach feels uncertain. Link doesn't really know exactly what's waiting for him down there. It's impossible to know. But at the heart of it was something that was powerful enough to defeat seven sages at once. The gloom spread beneath the castle is intense. It will be Link's greatest obstacle down here, just not getting overwhelmed with gloom infection and locking off his vitality. Everything seems to hit like a truck on top of it, and plans Link makes to ease his route can be undone by a single hit from a small foe. And to make it more difficult partway down, the avatars are banished. The power of the sages cannot reach him here. He fights the rest of the way alone and on foot. Things start to look a bit more familiar in the depths. He finds those murals that he and Zelda came across together when they first explored down here. And that feels like a lifetime ago at this point. When they found these, there was such excitement from the discovery and hope at learning more about their past, but it all fell apart so quickly when they found Ganondorf's husk. And that room completely collapsed. Now Link needs to descend it. It's a leap of faith, a sort of point of no return for him. It takes him down into the heart of the gloom infestation, and here there is only one path forward. It takes him on into another deep, dark drop. He readies his armor and his gear, and he takes one more plunge into the inescapable. Upon landing, the knight is ambushed by a swarm of Ganondorf's minions, some of his hardest-hitting mobs that each bring threats of gloom infection with them. Thankfully, ever so thankfully, the sages knew of the peril Link was descending into. No doubt, when their avatars were banished, they were made to know that trouble was on the horizon. They're here now to fight, to fight beside the knight against these waves and hordes of challenging foes. And each of them plays a valuable part. Even if they're simply taking aggro, getting attention off of Link so that he can focus something down. The first wave is defeated, which gives away to stronger Lizalfos, which then leads into the dreaded Gibdos of the Desert, a group that requires patience, kiting, and planning. And then finally, moblins that initially try to rush the knight. Were it not for the shields of Minero's construct, he might have been beaten down rather quickly. But with each sage stepping in to take heat off, it turns into a manageable fight. After the army of Ganondorf is defeated, they have but a moment to speak before greater foes rush the arena. The powerful bosses of each temple descend upon the group, but each sage is confident that they can handle their own Goliath. They send Link on to meet the Demon King, in what seems like the blink of an eye, they are separated by falling rocks, and the knight is alone to meet his great adversary. 
The Demon King sits alone, waiting for Link. His first words are not one of greeting, of understanding, of explanation, not even an introduction. No, it's... it's so much worse. It's boring. He complains. Ganondorf the Demon King, evil incarnated, and dull, and apparently delusional. Those he calls peace-loving cowards still control Hyrule and reign over it. His minions do not. He does not. Though he speaks as though he's already won the day. If they are weak, then what does that make him? Well, he wishes to fight a worthy foe, and so he will have one. The Demon King wraps himself in gloom and pulls himself together to take a more familiar, more striking form. The Gerudo King. He vows that he will crush his opposition and take his place as a ruler. For that is what a king must do. Admittedly, Ganondorf is a worthy foe once he stops speaking and picks up his blade. He's quick, aggressive, his hits are devastating, and the knight puts himself at risk of retaliation should he be hasty in his own attacks. He switches stances and weapons at a moment's notice and will flood the entire room with gloom if it means putting Link off his guard. Their duel is a spectacular one that almost ends badly for the knight a number of times, but in this round one, Link takes the victory. At the next phase, Ganondorf of course takes his time monologuing about the thrill of battle and the depths of his power. He's far more interested when he stops speaking and engages in battle. Next will be the Demon King, his stupid health bar, and his many phantoms. But at this point, bring it on, bud. The more, the merrier. The tougher, the better. To even the playing field a bit, the sages break through the rocks keeping the arena shut and engage the phantoms surrounding the knight. What began as a five-on-one equalizes into a field of just pure chaos. Yet the Demon King's gaze never falls away from the knight. Even if Link becomes distracted by another, he had best keep an eye on Ganondorf himself, because he will cross the entire arena to close the gap between them, and all his hits cause gloom infection. At the halfway point of this phase, the Demon King's mood shifts. He no longer wishes his phantoms or the sages to be present. He sends his phantoms away and knocks the sages the hell out in one hit. The rest of this will be between the knight and himself. His weapons change erratically and he uses what looks like gloom magic to punish Link at a distance. They have one hell of a back and forth, and in the end, Link wipes the floor with him. Oh, imagine the indignation that the almighty Demon King be cut down by one of the so-called cowards, those weaklings. He's not the sort of being to accept a loss, no. Remember that, of the legends of old, this is the same being that died on his feet in battle. He refused to accept defeat so long as he still drew breath. This will end in one of their deaths, as it always has time and time before. So Ganondorf consumes his secret stone. He will do as Zelda did, pursue the forbidden path, abandon his heart and his mind, and become an immortal dragon. Does that mean he's unkillable now? Well, we'll just have to see about that. All are taken to the surface, with Link holding onto the demon dragon as it flies into the sky. This might not be the Ganondorf that he just stood before in mind, but at heart, it's still a creature of pure evil. It must be destroyed or all of Hyrule will be ruined by it. The light dragon that was once Zelda captures the attention of the demon and draws it away from the land, high into the sky, so that all below might be kept safe, at least for now. Link grabs onto the light beast, the two of them will work together to bring down this fiend. From a great height, Link glides down to the demon, spying as he goes massive gloom pockets up its back. He works his way to one, and he destroys it, which throws him from the back of it. But the light dragon catches the knight before he can hit the ground. It will keep him safe at these great heights. This process must be carefully repeated for each gloom growth, all while dodging the demon's attacks in the air. Link works his way up its back, causing grievous harm with each series of strikes, and then finally the dragon's head where Ganondorf's secret stone is embedded. Link breaks the shielding around it and wails on the secret stone with all that he has left in him. It is enough to crack the stone, and with one more show of force, Link plunges the Master Sword directly through it, destroying the secret stone and stripping away what remains of the Demon King's power. What is left of the beast explodes in the atmosphere, a blinding display of light that signifies the end of this king's reign. The land will be freed of his minions, freed from his gloom. But this is not quite the end. There are wrongs that need to be undone, things that King Raru and Queen Sonya will personally see to. Link is taken one more time to that realm between places. Nearby, unmoving as though she were sleeping, is the Light Dragon. 
Grams and Gramps, together again, would like to see Zelda's life restored to what it should be. She made a grave sacrifice, but now it is time to see that undone. Link's sigil-infused hand, Rauru's light powers, and Sonya's mastery of time come together to return Princess Zelda to life, to as she was before she consumed her secret stone. And then the king and the queen pass on together, finally free from the cares of this world. But one more test for the night. Catch the princess. Would be a shame if he didn't after all of this. Link plunges at neck-breaking speeds towards the sleeping princess, holding her tight as the two of them just make high-speed contact with water. And they're definitely both dead now, right? Like they're turned into mush. Nah, don't worry. They're fine. Link carries the princess out of the lake, and she of course wakes up as soon as she's gently placed on the ground. No water in the lungs, no broken bones, and with her memory fully intact. All this time, she felt like she had been sleeping, unaware of the countless centuries that had passed. But she can tell that the Demon King is gone. They succeeded, their plan worked. She tells him that when she finally awoke, it felt like it was in a warm, loving embrace. It was Raru and Sonia, she knows, they gave her one last gift before departing. And now she gets to tell him all about them herself, about all the wonderful people that she met and what Hyrule was like way back then. And finally, after all this time, she gets to say, Oh, Link, I'm home. Now it seems, it is my time. Minoru! Do not worry. You have overcome the burden my era left to you. You have proven yourself, and you no longer need me. I know I can move on, join Raru and the others, and the world will be safe. Sonia will be happy to hear of this. But Minoru... <laughs> and I'll let them know just how much you care. Thank you, Warren. 